Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are on the throne. We thank you, Lord, that you still have a plan and purpose for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people. And Lord, we pray that we would uh, continually hold them up and encourage them and pray for them and pray, Lord, that uh, they would see Jesus as Messiah. And Father, we ask that you'd give us ears to hear um, what your spirit is saying to each one of us now. And we just thank you for your word. And we do pray, Lord, for the, the women's retreat this coming weekend, that you would just bless all the women that are going, uh, fill them with your spirit. Uh, Lord, may you watch over um, uh, the guest speaker that's coming out, Sarah Enterline and her family. And uh, we just pray you give them traveling mercies as everyone uh, meets there in Moab. And we just pray that it would be a blessed time and uh, the women would be encouraged and edified and strengthened in their relationship with you. And Lord, we thank you that you're with us always and you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you embrace each one of us here. Thank you, Lord, that you are not a respecter of persons. You love us all equally. And we ask these things and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, turn to Acts chapter 10. So I heard about this man who is riding in a taxi. And as they're going down the road, he reaches through the little window and he taps the driver on the shoulder. And the guy just freaks out. He starts yelling and screaming and he loses control of the taxi and he almost hits a school bus. He bounces up over the curb, comes to a stop on the sidewalk and he's shaking and just all, you know, messed up. And, and the guy in the back was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know reaching through and touching you would cause you to freak out like that. And he goes, no, no, it's not you. You know, this is my first week driving a taxi for the last 20 years. I've been driving a hearse. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I know. The hits just keep on coming. Well, here in chapter 10, Peter gets the shock of his life as the Holy Spirit will reach and touch his shoulder, and he's preparing him to bring the gospel to the first Gentiles. Uh, Jesus has already broken down that middle wall of separation. He is the one that has broken down the wall of division between holy God, sinful man, by going to the cross, shedding his blood for our sins, being the only uh, one who could redeem us through his perfect spotless blood. And he is desiring for all people to come into the kingdom of God. The salvation message, the power of the gospel is for anyone and everyone who will believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Gentiles. And so Jesus has paid the price in full, and it's only by receiving Christ that we can be uh, fully forgiven and then also permanently cleansed of our sins. So here in chapter 10, it's a very pivotal section of Scripture in the book of Acts. Uh, again, it records the salvation of the Gentiles. Now, this will be the third and final time that Peter, you know, he's been given the keys of the kingdom. And he's been unlocking the door of faith to the Jews first on the day of Pentecost. We saw that he was used to lay hands on the Samaritans who were half Jews, half Gentiles. And now he's being prepared to go to the dreaded Gentiles. So Jesus said in Matthew 16, look at these verses starting in verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Not on Peter, he's a Petros. Jesus says, on this rock, Petra, I'll build my church. And what is the rock? It's the statement Peter made that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's what we build the church on, Jesus, not <laughs> Peter, by any means. And so he says, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so that's what it's referring to, unlocking the door of faith to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and now to the Gentiles. Uh, Acts 1.8 is where Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, all Samaria, and to the end of the earth, referring to the Gentiles. Now, we've already seen how God has been breaking down the walls of prejudice in Peter's heart. Uh, here's a man who's a very devout Jew. And then he becomes a follower of Jesus. And it was no problem for him talking to his fellow Jews about their Messiah, Jesus. And then he stretched a little bit when he goes to the Samaritans. 
And then we saw last time it ended with him going to the house of Simon a tanner. He was Jewish, but he's considered unclean because he worked with skins, animal skins. And uh, because they were dead animals, they were considered unclean. And so the Lord's preparing his heart. Uh, and now he has the biggest uh, job, in a sense, before him where he's going to go to the dreaded Gentiles. Uh, they were looked down upon the Jews. They were looked down upon because they were unclean. Um, Gentiles didn't have the word of God. They didn't have the laws of God. They didn't have the temple. And many self-righteous Jews would say they are unclean. Even if you were touched by a Gentile, you'd have to go through a ceremony to be cleansed. And no self-respecting Jew would allow himself to be there. And Peter will bring this up later on. Now, for Peter, these are hard issues. Uh, they needed to be dealt with in his own life. But as we saw last week, the Lord's really working on him. And God's going to use this situation to break down the final barriers in Peter's heart when it comes to the prejudices he had in his own life. And God's going to show him and hopefully all of us that God loves everybody. Doesn't matter what your background, doesn't matter what your nationality, doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, doesn't matter what about anything, God loves everybody. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, the world. Not just the world of the chosen, he loves everybody. Jesus is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. So the potential is there for anybody and everybody to get saved if they'll put their faith in Jesus. If you don't, then you won't be saved. You'll end up in the lake of fire. But the potential is there because God loves everybody. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Now, from a Jewish perspective, uh, the worst of the Gentiles were the Roman soldiers. Uh, most of the uh, Roman soldiers treated the Jews horribly. They were very prejudiced against the Jewish people. Uh, they were the ones that had conquered Israel. They were the ones that were controlling Israel. They were the ones who were putting heavy taxes upon the people of Israel. There are a few exceptions to the rule when it comes to the Roman soldiers, and one of them is this guy named Cornelius that we'll look at. We see another one earlier in the Gospels because they were both centurions, and usually the centurions had a lot of respect, and they also were respected by the Jews because they really did have a heart for the Jewish people. Few of them did, and we'll see one of them here in a moment. So look at chapter 10. We pick up in verse 1, and again, a very pivotal chapter. This is where the Gentiles get saved. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Again, being a centurion meant that he was a leader of an elite group of soldiers, centurion, century 100. So he was a leader over 100 uh, Roman soldiers, very highly respected and regarded. Um, he's from uh, Caesarea here. That's where he's stationed. That's where he's living. Uh, you got some pictures of Caesarea. I mean, it's one of my favorite places in Israel when we go there. You know, it's amazing. This is what King Herod built this in honor of Caesar, but there's so many of the ruins that are still there. This is part of the stadium. This is probably where they, they rebuilt a lot of it, but this is where Paul would have preached to King Agrippa. It's right on the Mediterranean coast. It's just amazing. Keep going through there, and I'll ad lib as I see. There's the aqueduct. So this aqueduct, Caesar or uh, Herod builds, it goes from the Phrygian Mountains to Caesarea, and it's got like a one inch every quarter mile drop. I mean, the te technology, the archaeology, everything that we've seen and what they did back then, it's just totally amazing. I actually got a piece of the... Um, un <laughs> I, better not, I better not go there. I'll get in trouble. Um, I had climbed up on top, and there was a, it's loose. It's loose. And So anyway, tour guide said, eh, okay, we'll let it slide this time. Anyway, it, it's just a, a beautiful place. They had a, a harbor there, um, Caesar... That's, yeah, Herod built this amazing harbor, and then you can still see the remnants of it. He used underwater cement, something, you know, it was just amazing for the time, and it was a massive harbor. And then he built this hippodrome a couple hundred yards long. That's where it had chariot races, and that's all been found and uncovered. So just a, a beautiful place, very modern city. Verse 2, <laughs> I'll move on. A devout man who feared God... So this is Cornelius, with all his household who gave alms generously to the people 
and prayed to God always. And so he is a guy that grew tired of all the pagan idols that the Romans worshipped. The Romans had gods to everything and everyone, and they were very superstitious. And at some point in his life, you know, uh, Cornelius turns to Judaism in hopes of finding salvation. And I believe he's an excellent example of someone who is living up to the light that God has revealed to him. In other words, he's a sincere seeker of truth. God saw his heart, and God is going to give him an opportunity to hear the good news of Christ and make a decision for Jesus. Now, Cornelius wanted to know the one true God of the universe. He wanted to know who created all these things. He wanted to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, it says here he's a good man. It says here he was a devout. He gave gifts. In other words, he gave alms, you know, blessings to the, the Jewish people. It says he even prayed, but he was not saved. Why? What is lacking in his life? Jesus? Yeah, obviously it's Jesus. But God sees his heart, and he's going to minister to this guy. He's going to reach out to him. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, so this is 3 in the afternoon, Cornelius here, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He said, So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. I mean, this is so cool because it just shows us the heart of God towards those who were lost, those who were sincerely seeking. And I can imagine his prayer was something like, God, I don't know. I think you're real. I don't know who you are. You probably don't care about a peon like me. You're probably a billion light years away. But if you're out there, you know, Lord, I just want to know you. I understand. I want to understand your plans and purposes for my life. And the reason I can make that assumption about Cornelius praying that way is that's how I prayed before I got saved. You know, I was very humbled when I was in college. A lot of you heard my testimony. And so in that for about a week, I was just dreading life. I was really discouraged. My idol for me was removed. And I thought, what am I going to do now? And I was just so bummed out. I always believe there's a God out there, but I can never know God. I mean, who am I? I mean, why would he even care about me? And so I finally, for the first time in my life, it's like, God, if you're real, I want to know you on your terms, not my terms. And little did I know that God was working on uh, the end of another person, same time he was working on my heart, and we're seeing he's going to be working on Cornelius' heart at the same time he's working on Peter's heart. He's going to bring them together. And I had a, you know, part of my testimony is just how God did that with me. There was a guy on our team who was a born-again Christian. When I'd curse out, I'd tell him to take a hike. I, I didn't want to hear the gospel from him until this time. And he's coming around the corner at the gymnasium there at San Diego State. And I say, hey, Ron, get over here. And he sat there for five hours. And I grilled him on anything I could think of about God. And he didn't know everything. He was a young believer, but he's on fire for the Lord. And, you know, I found out later that he'd never gone that way to his class before. And so my best friend Rob and I were just sitting there, just like, what are we going to do now? Because he quit the team and I got kicked off the team. And I found out later, you know, Ron said, yeah. Or, yeah, Ron, like, I was heading to class and I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, go over here. And so he turned the corner and there we were. And then I saw him, I was like, get over here. <laughs> I wasn't very nice, but, I mean, it was amazing. God used that, invited us to Calvary Chapel in San Diego. That's where I heard uh, the gospel very clearly. And this time, I was receptive, and the Lord broke through. And so that's what we see here with Cornelius. God is reaching out to him. He's touching his life. At the same time, he's working on Peter's heart, preparing him to minister to this Gentile Roman centurion. Look at verse 5. So this is what the angel tells Cornelius. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And it literally means he'll tell you what you must do in order to be saved. We'll see that later on. So a lot of stuff people call a coincidence is not a coincidence at all. It's a God incident. God is setting this up. It's not like, oh, it's a coincidence. He's speaking to me about this guy over here in Joppa. And then we'll see Peter's like, oh, he's showing me things about some unclean stuff. But it's God working together. It's a God incident. 
God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. And again, he's at work behind the scenes, bringing this all together. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior at this point in your life, I don't know what you're waiting for. The clock is ticking. The time bomb's about to explode. But if you haven't received him, it's not a God coincidence. It's a God incident that you're here. It's not a coincidence. It's a God incident. He wants you to hear that Jesus loves you. Jesus demonstrated his love toward you. He died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood for you. So that if you died today, then you will go to heaven. If you got, die tomorrow, you'll go to heaven. You die 10 years from now, you're going to go to heaven. But you have to put your faith and trust in Christ alone. So here the Lord is telling Cornelius, send people uh, to Joppa. Send for Peter. He's about 30 miles south of Caesarea. It's on the outskirts there of uh, present-day Tel Aviv. And it says, he will tell you what you must do. Verse 7. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. And so just like an obedient soldier and these servants, they say, okay, yes, sir. And they head out 30 miles, probably take you 13, 14 hours to walk from Caesarea to Joppa. And so in the meantime, look at verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's noon. And so this shows us Peter is still very much Jewish in his approach to life. Um, the Jews prayed religiously at nine in the morning, at noon and three o'clock. And so uh, here he is. It's noon. I got to be praying. Uh, later on, the Apostle Paul will say, pray without ceasing. In other words, God's throne room of grace is open 24-7. You don't need to wait for something bad to happen to go to the Lord. You don't have to wait till, oh man, it's only 11.20. I can't pray till noon. No, if you're going through something now, call out to the Lord. He will hear. He will answer. He will minister to you. So be that as it may, God is about to do an amazing work in Peter's heart. Verse 10. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. It's, it's like a dreamlike state. He's just, more than just daydreaming, it's like a dreamlike state. But notice, and he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet. Now don't think of a bed sheet. It's more of a, some say it's more like a sail, a sailboat. And it, it's a large sheet, and it says here, it was bound at the four corners, descending to him, and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And we're going to find out these are not kosher animals. These are unclean animals. And, and so... Peter gets this strange vision. All these weird animals dropping down be, before him. And why did God use this vision of unclean animals? Because there was a big distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles when it came to their eating habits. Gentiles could eat anything. Jews, as you know, God was very clear not what to eat and what not to eat. You can read it in... in uh, uh, Leviticus, there's a lot of writings about what they were to eat and not eat. But that distinction caused this division between Jews and Gentiles. Um, but God is about to teach Peter in a very important lesson. Look at verse 13. And a voice came to him, and this is Jesus speaking, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. <laughs> and But Peter said, Not so, Lord. Okay. For I have never eaten anything, common or unclean. Now, again, so typical of Peter. He recognizes this is the voice of the Lord. And Jesus says, rise and eat. But Peter blurts out, not so, Lord. Now, you can say no, and you can say, Lord. But you can't say, no, Lord. You can't say it. You can't put those two together. He is the Lord. And if you're truly following the Lord, you never say no to him. You always say yes to him. You obey his word. Um, when I've been in India, 
Emily has said, hey, try this. And I can say, not so, Emily. I can do that. But I can't say, not so, Lord. But I, I've said that a lot to Emily. You enjoy, not so. And I'm not going to eat it. Now, if you go back about 10 or 12 years earlier when Jesus was telling the disciples about his impending you know, death, crucifixion, how he's going to be beat, beaten, mistreated you know, in Jerusalem, um, it was Peter who blurted it out, no way, Lord, this shall not happen to you. And he, he's you know, coming against the Lord. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter very harshly because of his ignorance. He was trying to stop Jesus from going to the cross, the whole purpose of why Christ came. And how quickly we can go from this glorious revelation to our own stupidity. Here's his glorious revelation. Not so, Lord. And then before... You know, it was Peter who said, you know, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And it was Peter who said, you're the Lord. You're the, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, well done, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven gave you this supernatural revelation. And then it was right after that, Jesus talks about going to the cross. No way, that's not going to happen to you. And what did Jesus tell him? Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. You were putting men before me. So just before his crucifixion, Jesus is telling his disciples, you're all going to deny me. You're all going to flee. And that's when Peter said, no, it's not going to happen. Even if you die, I'll die with you. And he's like, no, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Everything came to Peter in threes. Sure enough, even though Peter said, oh, it's not going to happen, you know, he denied the Lord three times and cock a doodle do. You know, he did it. After Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus is very gracious. He knows Peter. And so three times he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Lord, I, I love you three times. Tend my sheep. He's restored later on, or be, even before that, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. He goes further with them into the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, wait here, pray. I'll be right back. Three times he did that. He came back to him. You guys still asleep? Come on. Came and watch and wait for an hour. Everything came in threes. So, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. It's like he's adamant to, to Jesus here. I've never, and I will never, eat anything that's non-kosher. Verse 15, And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. This was done again three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Peter's probably thinking, man, I'm so stubborn. I'm so thick-headed. What's going on here? I don't understand this. What's, what are you trying to tell me, God? God's breaking through, though, because God is simply not going to change his diet, but he's changing Peter's entire outlook on humanity. Jesus said to his disciples at one point when he was talking about food, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man. That's what defiles him. The food you eat, he says it's eliminated. But what goes in? And that's for all of us. What are you putting into your mind? It's going to end up in your heart. If you're focusing on things you shouldn't be looking at on screens or whatever, reading stuff that's not godly, that's going to get into your heart. That's going to defile you. But it's what goes into your heart that defiles. What comes out of your life, that's what's important. So make sure you're putting the godly, spiritual things that are of the Word of God into your life. Food, it doesn't matter. I've known a lot of, you know, Messianic Jews, true Messianic Jews, not these Jewish wannabes, but Messianic Jews who, they're like, I can eat whatever I want. Yeah, I'll eat a pork chop, no problem. You know Larry Dubin, we've had him here a few times. They're, he and his wife are both very uh, strong, you know, grew up Orthodox Jews. They get saved. They were part of Jews for Jesus for many years. Now they're in another ministry in Florida. And uh, great people. He's come out here numerous times. And... Um, his wife, Deb, she'll eat anything. I, I love all food. She said, Larry still won't eat anything that's pork. He'll eat a lot of other stuff, but he won't eat pork. And he goes, it's just a personal thing with me. And it's like, that's fine. You're not forced to. 
nobody's going to force you to eat pork. You know, it's a choice you have. He's chosen. No, I, I just, it's just a weird thing with me. I know. So I said, well, where do you want to go to lunch? Anywhere where I can get something besides pork. I said, okay. <laughs> so we usually end up going to the Texas Roadhouse. He can find something on the menu. But be that as it may, here Peter is um, saying, okay, this is done three times to me. I'm not sure what's going on here. But what God is showing him is that food doesn't make you holy and righteous. Not eating food will not make you unholy, unrighteous. Not eating certain things will, won't make you holy or un, unholy. I mean, food is just food. It's benign, you might say, when it comes to your spiritual walk, your position in Christ. So what God is showing Peter here is that the Jew is not clean because of a kosher diet. It's, it's not because the Gentiles have an unkosher diet that they're unclean. Paul's going to bring this out, and he's been bringing it out in the book of Romans. We're all unclean before Jesus saves us. Romans 3.23, you're familiar with this verse. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, there's none righteous. No, not one. Jew and Gentile. We all need Jesus. Romans 11.32 says, For God committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. This meant that a Gentile did not have to become a Jew first in order to become a Christian because we're all sinners who need Jesus. And when we get to chapter 15, this is where the first church council takes place and this would be a turning point for the followers of Christ because some of the Jews from Jerusalem who had come to Jesus were still very much under the Mosaic law. And they were saying, unless you're circumcised according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Telling the Gentiles, you gotta get you gotta become a Jew first, then you can come to Jesus. Paul says, Are you kidding me? They're coming to Christ, the Spirit's coming upon them by just putting their faith and trust in Christ alone. Peter will stand up and say, Why do we want to put our you know these Gentiles under the law? when we and our fathers couldn't even keep the law. You know, why do we want to hang that on him? And then Peter is going to go back and forth in the book of Galatians because Peter's up there in Galatia, mostly Gentiles, and they're eating pork chops, having, you know, ham sandwiches, and, and Paul's having a great time with all Gentiles. Peter comes up, and he starts eating with them, non-kosher food, and it's a great time. And then these Judaizers come up from Jerusalem, and they get on Peter's case. What are you doing? So Peter, it says, withdrew from the people because of his conviction by, not the Lord, but by these Judaizers. And Paul gets in Peter's face in Galatians 2 and says, you're a hypocrite, Peter. You're a Jew. You're eating with the Gentiles, living like the Gentiles. Now you're trying to withdraw, and now you're saying you're a Jew? You can't eat with the Gentiles? And now you're telling the Gentiles they got to be like Jews? No. And so they call him out on it. It's faith alone in Christ alone. That is the proper way to come to Christ. So God is showing Peter, I'm not a respecter of persons. I look at all people the same as sinners who need the Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. It's not the world of the chosen. It's the world at large. Men and women, boys and girls from every background, culture, it doesn't matter what they look like, what they're from, their economic status. God loves the world. And because he loves the world so much, he sent his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him, if you're a whoever today and you haven't put your faith and trust in him, God sees you. He sees your heart. He knows your pain. He knows your suffering. He knows what you're going through. He knows that you're lost without Jesus. And he's here knocking on the door of your heart. If anybody will open the door. Let me in. I'll save you. But you have to come to Christ and he'll give you everlasting life. Again, there's no place for prejudice in the body of Christ. There is no place in Peter's heart for prejudice against the Gentiles. It's kind of flip-flop today, right? There's no place in your heart for prejudice against Jewish people. If you're anti-Semitic, then this is for you. You need to repent. You need to get right with the Lord. Because here in Peter's heart, he has never had to deal with this in all of his life. 
And now he's being challenged. You know, he's been a spirit-filled Christian for about 10 years since Pentecost, but he still has this deep ingrained prejudice against the Gentiles. You might have a prejudice against some other group out there, but God wants to root it out of your life. And it's like the Lord saying, Peter, it's time to deal with this prejudice in your heart. Again, there might be something in your life, some area of sin, a bad attitude, a critical spirit about somebody or everybody. It's never been dealt with. Well, maybe today the Lord is telling you, let's deal with this sin right now. You've got to give it to the Lord. And there's a powerful example of this very thing in the book of Joshua. Joshua is used by the Lord after Moses died. Joshua is the one that brought him into the promised land. The Lord backs up the Jordan River. They cross on dry land. You know, they, they, their first battle wasn't a battle. God did it all. But circle around Jericho seven times. All the walls fall down. They win the battle. They're all excited. This is amazing. They're all so happy. And then they come to this little town, pagan village called Ai. That's how you spell it, Ai. So I don't know how you pronounce it. I, oi, whatever. I don't know, I. So they come to this little pagan village. And they say, oh, we'll send 3,000 soldiers. We'll whip them. No problem here. And they get defeated. And Joshua is just flabbergasted. What in the world's going on here, Lord? You told us to come in, and wherever we set our feet, it's ours. And God has to show them what they were doing that was wrong. He had warned them, do not take anything from these pagans. None of their silver, none of their gold, none of their idols, none of their clothing, nothing. And then we read about the sin of, a uh, sin of Achan. Achan. Achan for a bruising. You know, Achan did a stupid thing. He goes in, he takes a bunch of the stuff from Jericho and he hides it under his tent. And look at this in Joshua chapter 7, verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, this is why Joshua was like, why did we lose? What's going on here? And he says, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. So you don't to say, oh, i got the Bible here, and let's throw some other junk in with it. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up sanctify your the people and say sanctify yourselves for tomorrow because thus says the lord god of israel there is an accursed thing in your midst O israel you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you so that is what god is doing here with peter he's rooting out the accursed thing among him his prejudice towards gentiles he can't move forward, even as the uh, Israelites couldn't move forward until he gets his relationship with God right and his love for others right. Does God need to root out anything in your life today? Is there something hindering your walk with the Lord? Yeah, you can be saved. You know you're going to heaven, but you're not being used the way God wants to use you if you're holding on to something of the flesh. You need to give it over to the Lord. He wants you to have nothing in your life that's going to hinder your walk with Jesus and your relationship with others. If the Lord's speaking to you, I want to encourage you to turn it over to the Lord today. Just simply confess it to God. Lay it at the foot of the cross. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I can guarantee it is so much better to give it up now, turn it over to the Lord now, than it is to wait for God to root it out later. I've done that, and it's a lot more painful for the Lord to remove it later. If I would have just humbled myself and given it to him right away, it would have been a lot less painful and a lot less worry and anxiousness and anxiety and all those things. Don't let that little sin, don't let that little bitterness, don't let that little rebellion, certainly don't let any anti-Semitism or any other prejudice be in your heart. You need to let God root it out now so you can be cleansed and refreshed by His Holy Spirit. Verse 17. 
Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for, for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So they come into Joppa and they're, you know, knocking on doors and looking around, where does he live? Oh, he's over here. And so now they're outside the gate there. They, they find Simon the, the tanner's place. And they stood before the gate, verse 18, and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, again, he's up on top of the roof, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And so as he's wondering, what in the world's going on with this sheet being lowered down and these unclean animals? Jesus says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. This is so bizarre. Then the Holy Spirit says, go down. There's three men waiting for you, and you are to doubt nothing. And that phrase is so important. It means make no distinction. In other words, don't look at them, and all of a sudden you say, Gentiles, you're not welcome. Don't do that is what God is telling him. Peter, don't discriminate against these men because they are, are Gentiles. I have sent them. That's why they're here. And so God's got Peter's attention. Verse 21, Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. Again, that's a huge thing to bring them into this house. That's an amazing thing. In fact, when we look at chapter 11 and Peter's reporting to the men in Jerusalem how this all took place, one of the first things they say to Peter is, you A with Gentiles? You had them in your home? I mean, it was a big deal, so don't overlook this. Yeah, he invites them in. He, they lodge there. On the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied them. Again, in chapter 11, we'll see that there are six Jewish believers in Jesus that are going to go with Peter up to Cornelius's place there in Caesarea. And so this is just an amazing scene. So it's, again, 30-mile journey to get back up there. Look at verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. you got to love it. He invites everybody he knows. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Oh, no, he's worshipping the first pope. No, he's not. Well, he thought he was. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. I mean, I'm sure Cornelius is just overwhelmed. You know, I had this vision. This angel spoke to me and I called for Peter. Here he is. And he's just overwhelmed. He falls down before him and he says, Get up. I'm just a man like you. We'll see this later on with uh, Paul and Barnabas. They, they go in and there's a guy that was, you know, had, uh, he was lame. The Lord uses him to heal him. And all the people there say, oh, the gods have come down among us. And they started calling Barnabas Zeus and they called Paul Hermes. And they wanted to worship him. He's like, no, no, we're just men like you. And that's what Peter's doing. I'm just a man. I'm nobody special. Listen, there's only one person that needs to be exalted and that's Jesus Christ. You know, Paul makes it very, very clear in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the one that we worship. He's the one we go to. So Peter says, don't bow down to me. Verse 27, And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. I mean, this is so cool. Because Cornelius is so excited to hear what God's going to do and how he's going to minister. He calls all of his relatives, all of his close friends. They come to hear what God wants to say through Peter. You know, may the Lord give us that same desire to reach our lost family members and friends. You know, when I got saved, I was the first person in our family that I knew of 
cousins and relatives. I was the first one to come to Christ. And then God used me to share with my sister and my little sister and then my cousins. And it just kind of spread out from there. And then there's a bunch that came to Christ. But it's got to start somewhere. I mean, we're a very pagan family. And so God wants to do a work and he wants to use you to minister to those around you. Like I said last week, you know, with... Um, uh, Saul of Tarsus, least likely person to get saved. Nobody wanted to see him because he was going to probably arrest you and kill you or lock you up. And so people wanted to avoid Saul of Tarsus. And then he gets saved. And people still wanted to avoid him. But God used him. And God wants to use people in your life. And he wants to use your life to reach other people. And so keep proclaiming the good news to family members and friends. Keep praying for them. Keep loving them. God doesn't desire for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Verse 28. Then he, and this is Peter, said to them, as he looks at this room full of people, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. I mean, he's got, it's got to be a little awkward for Peter being in the house of a bunch of Gentiles. And he even says, you know how unlawful it is to keep company with you guys, even to be here. But, but God. I love that those two words, but God. Read Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5. I mean, it's an amazing section of Scripture. It talks about how we were, you know, uh, dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive together with Christ. But we were being led by the prince of the power of the air, and then, you know, all these bad things we've done. And then it says, but God but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he just saved us and he brought us out of this kingdom of darkness. We're seated with him in glory. It's just amazing what God can do. And so here, Peter's responding to the revealed word of God. The Lord told him, go. Don't doubt me. Don't ask any more questions, Peter. Just go in obedience. He goes because he heard the word of God. He obeys the word of God. And God has clearly shown Peter, this is an area in your life that needs to be surrendered. And here we see that he surrendered it to the Lord because he, he tells him, I really shouldn't be here, but God, he's shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And that's true for any of us in here. Don't look at anybody and think they should go to hell. Well, we should all go to hell. We all deserve the lake of fire. But we should see people the way Jesus sees them. We are to love everybody that he brings into our lives. God loves everybody. Now, there's a phrase that is so true. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Obviously, it's understandable. But that's why Jesus came, to die on the cross for our sins. But God so loved the world, that's why Jesus died for us. So we love everybody. That's our job. He judges He's the ultimate judge. We just love them. We point them to Jesus. We don't agree with them. That's where a lot of churches have gotten off base. Oh, we got to love everybody, welcome everybody, then tolerate everybody's sin. Oh, it doesn't matter what lifestyle you have. It doesn't matter. God doesn't care. And yes, he does. Jesus died for your sin. He didn't die so you could stay in sin. So don't ever get that mixed up. He wants people set free from their sins so they can have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And so here we see that the prejudice in his heart has been turned over to the Lord. And now he's got this new hunger to be used by God to minister to these people that before he wouldn't even want to be in their presence. So prejudice has been replaced by love, the love of Jesus. Now Peter's able to look at these Gentiles with love instead of with contempt. This is when I believe he officially embraces the Gentiles. And that's the name of the title of this message was Embracing Gentiles. And, you know, I think about some who's totally been mistreated. How many remember Jackie Robinson? You've heard of Jackie Robinson? First black player to be in the major leagues. Uh, they did a movie a few years back called 42. It was really pretty accurate. But um, the things that he went through, the ridicule, the name-calling, the N-word, they call him anything and everything. I mean, it was brutal the way he was treated when he, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers called him up in 1947, and he, he was a first base at that time. He later played second base. 
multi-time all-star player. He was just amazing. He had so much pressure on him being the first black allowed into an all-white Major League Baseball system. There was two guys, two guys that rallied around him because he was so brutalized. The way they treated him, calling him names, spitting at him, I mean, horrible things. One was a guy named Hank Greenberg. I love his nickname. He was called the Hebrew Hammer. He was a Jewish guy. He refused to play on Yom Kippur, but he was ama he's in the Hall of Fame. And 1947 was his last season. With, he played most of his career with the Detroit uh, Tigers. His last season was with the Pittsburgh Pirates National League team, so he got to play there when... Uh, Jackie Robinson's first year, 1947, and he'd come alongside of him and try to encourage him. I know what it's like. I've been called every name in the book because he was a Jew. And so he, could, he was able to relate to him. The other time was they were in Cincinnati that first season, and everybody in Cincinnati just booing him, calling him every name. Was, the place was packed because it's almost like we got an oddity here. Here's a black man playing baseball. And so the stadium was crowded. They're screaming and yelling at him, calling him every name. He was at first base. This is even before the game started. And they're just ridiculous. He was just like pfft, almost in tears. I mean, it was so horrible. And it was Pee Wee Reese, their shortstop. This is an old white guy. He's in the Hall of Fame, too. He comes alongside of him at first base, just puts his arm around him, just embraced him. And for the first time, everybody screaming, yelling, and as soon as he did that, the place went silent. And that was probably the first time in Jackie's life where he didn't feel like an outcast, where he felt like, I'm a human being. People need to see me as a human being. That's what we are. That's what, you know, these Gentiles, they're human beings, the Jews, human beings in Christ. There's neither Jew or Gentile. Slave or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ. Verse 29. Therefore I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, well, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So here Peter has just got to be blown away as he is just like, this is amazing. God's not a respecter of persons. He, you know, it's like, why am I here? Because God told me to send for you. But what do you got to tell us? I don't know. I'm here. I obey God. He said, go. So here I am. What are we, what are we doing? And, and it's just like, I want to hear God's plan of salvation. That's what Cornelius is asking. Tell us about this Jesus person. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth. That was never a problem with Peter. He opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him, and works righteousness is accepted by him. So here Peter has to publicly admit, I was wrong. I now realize God is not a respecter of persons. He loves us all equally. He will reveal himself to all who are genuinely seeking after him. Again, God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. Uh, one of my favorite stories, you know, one of the biblical stories is when God tells Samuel, Go to the house of Jesse. You're going to anoint one of his sons to be the next king because King Saul blew it. So he goes to Jesse's house and bring the firstborn, Eliab, bring him in. And as soon as he walks in, Samuel's like, surely this is the man. You know, he's tall, handsome, and all this. And, and God's like, no, no, no. You're looking wrong. You're looking at the wrong place. You're looking at the outward. And this is what God tells him in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. 
because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's what Peter is now realizing. God sees the heart. He sees these Gentiles who are lost. They're doomed. They're damned without Jesus. And his heart begins to melt. Verse 36. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, talking about the baptism of John, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Again, if you're feeling oppressed today by anything in this world, it's the devil. He's the one that's oppressing you, trying to depress you, trying to get you discouraged. Jesus came to set captives free, heal the brokenhearted. It's not God who brings condemnation. It's Satan. Uh, Jesus said, John 3, 17, which just so happens to come after John 3, 16. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he's not here condemning anybody. He's here to save you if you don't know him as Lord and Savior. In John 5, 24, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Again, Jesus took all the condemnation that we deserve, all the wrath and judgment we deserve upon himself when he hung on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was absorbing the penalty and the punishment for our sin that we deserve. He took it upon himself. And so when you receive Christ, all the punishment and payment that you now deserve, it's gone because Jesus took it upon himself. But if you say, I don't want Jesus, I'm going to do it on my own. Well, that condemnation and judgment of God will come upon you. So the smart thing is to give your life to Christ. We're going to pick up most of this next week, but let me just read it a little bit further here in verse 39. Peter says, And we are witnesses of all things which he, Jesus, did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. You know, they nailed him to the cross. Him, God raised up, on the third day and showed him openly. So that's the resurrection. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Paul says he appeared to over 500 people at one time during those 40 days after the resurrection, and then he descended up into heaven. And he, Jesus, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He, it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets, speaking of the Old Testament prophets, witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission or forgiveness of sins. Peter's not done talking. But while he was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. So that's when salvation came. Peter's like, I'm halfway through my message, and God said, you said enough. You know you know how to open your mouth, but I'm going to close your mouth right now, because as soon as he's still speaking, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. That's when they are now born again, and it's going to be amazing. The first Gentiles that are coming into the body of Christ. So we'll stop here. Lord willing, we'll be here next... Well, well we are planning on being here next Sunday, about 80 women won't be here next Sunday. That'll be different. But I hope all of you can make it, get an extra hour of sleep. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you have saved sinners like us. Lord, you've taken us from the depths of despair and you've brought us into your kingdom. You took us from death to life, from eternal damnation to everlasting life, from darkness to light. 
Lord, you have done it all. And all we can do is praise you and thank you and pray for your Holy Spirit to strengthen us so that we can continue to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. And Lord, once again, even as you did with Peter, some 10 years after he was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, you showed him things in his life that weren't quite right. And Lord, thank you for that example where he surrendered that prejudice towards Gentiles to you, and then he could become an instrument in your hands. And Lord, if there's anything in our hearts this morning that is not pleasing to you, we pray, Lord, that we would lay it at the foot of the cross. We ask that your Holy Spirit would cleanse us and refresh us and renew us. May your blood wash over us again, Lord, cleansing us of all unrighteousness. And Father, refill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can be the men and women that you want us to be, light and salt in this world around us that is perishing. And Lord, as we look at these things in this chapter and we look at our nation right now and we see all the division in our nation because of the elections, Lord, give us that strength to not go to our neighbors and rip down their signs. Lord, help us to pray for those that we know aren't following you. It's not a Republican, Democrat thing. It's we're saved and you want others saved. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be light and salt in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our schools, wherever you have us, Lord. Help us to be vessels of honor for your glory. And Father, we do pray for our nation. I know we're going to get what we deserve, but Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy in us, in individual Christians' lives. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We pray for your mercy upon our nation. We are so far away from where we started and just the killing, the abortions, everything, Lord, that we are guilty of. Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us. But Lord, you need to change our nation. Turn us around. Bring us back to you. But Lord, we know that in your timing, the trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and we are, we're going to meet you in the air, and we're going to be with you. We're going to receive resurrection bodies. That's our living hope, to be with you in glory forever and ever, and to rule and reign with you for a thousand years on earth. What an amazing time that will be. And so, Lord, our hope is not in Washington, D.C. Our hope is in you. And so, Father, strengthen us, encourage us. Whatever direction this election goes, we just pray that you would help us to be stronger in our walk with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.